Welcome to today's session, everyone. We are PreMedCC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those who do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end up with a Q&A with the speaker. Any questions that you have, you may put it in the Q&A session on Zoom, and our team members will read them and have them answer. After you have attended our event, you can log in to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with the upcoming events or just want to tell your pre-med friends about the pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok as at pre-med CC. All right, so let's get this event started with. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dr. Nilu. I am a second year orthodontics resident at UCLA, and um, I will be moderating this event today. Um, so a little bit about myself. I, um, a little bit about myself. I moved from Tehran in Iran at age of 18 to San Jose, California. I didn't know what I wanted to do in my career, so I studied, I studied my academic journey at De Anza Community College, having an undecided major. Later, I started um, shadowing a dentist and fell in love with the profession. Um, so I decided to choose that path. Um, after finishing my prerequisites at De Anza, I transferred to UC Davis, where I studied neurobiology, physiology, and behavior. After that, I pursued my dental degree at UCSF School of Dentistry, and currently, I am doing my, my orthodontics residency in a three-year residency training program at UCLA. Um, I'm very excited to moderate this event and present the exceptional program we have planned for you today. Thank you for being here and let's get this started with. Um, so I'm going to provide you with an overview of our event for today. We have an, inc an incredible lineup planned for you. Um, our keynote, keynote speaker is Dr. Matt Mike Stout, who is a practicing dentist in Placerville, California. Following Dr. Stout, we have Dr. Hewlett, the Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion from UCLA, who will share his valuable insights. Next, we have Mr. Roger Amraz, the Program Administrator at UCSF, and Mr. Roger Korpetsky, a dental student at UCSF, who also works in the admission office. Then we are honored to have Ms. Melissa Yamanaka, the Dean for Diversity and Outreach Manager at UOP. And lastly, we have an engaging student panel featuring six ex exceptional dental students from UCLA, UCSF, and UOP. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Mike Stout. Um, Dr. Stout is a patient-centric dentist uh, practicing in Placerville, California, known for his focus on clinical excellence and the mouth-body connection. He, tra he transitioned from information technology to healthcare in 2009 and holds degrees from American River College and UC Davis. He earned his DDS degree and an advanced education in general dentistry certificate from the University of Pacific School of Dentistry. Dr. Stout has taken on leadership roles throughout his education and enjoys inspiring others to pursue their passion. Dr. Stout, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nalib. Um, well, I'm happy to be here today to kind of share some of my journey and challenges and really ultimately what I needed to do to become a successful applicant in dental school. Um, 
I grew up uh, in a family where college wasn't really a priority. I didn't understand the importance of it. And I was kind of in and out of it throughout my life, just pursuing things that I enjoyed, topics that I wanted to go into and exploring. But um, it wasn't until later in life where uh, I found that education was important to me. And that's what kind of led on to um, where I'm at today as a practicing dentist. So let me get my PowerPoint started. I've got uh, quite a few slides to go through and I'll be happy to take your questions at the end. Um, one moment. And is that up? Dr. Neelu? Yep, we can see it. Oh, thank you. Um, so just a little bit uh, about myself. I grew up in Rancho Cordova and went to Cordova High School. Um, I dropped out of college uh, to work or really just kind of postponed my college uh, for working. Um, when I was working at first, I was kind of, I call it chasing the next highest paying job, doing what I needed to do um, to make money to live on, to get to the weekend, have fun. And um, uh, through that part, through that time, I'd found the things in life that I enjoyed doing. And I had decided that I wanted to continue education. And I felt that the healthcare was a great thing to study, whether or not you want to be a doctor. I mean, it's important. I mean, our health is the one thing that is going to hold us back from anything. And we should really know how to manage that. So I had a 10-year career in computers, uh, did various things from uh, computer repair to networking to database administration. And I just put that to the side to go to college full time. Um, and it wasn't easy. Um, I When I ended up quitting, I, my understanding was is that I was going to be able to get loans to go all the way through by uh, my educational process, which at first that wasn't the case because I kind of did a lot of running around with, between counseling and financial aid and discovered that I, because I'd taken so many courses before, I was now ineligible to get financial aid. And I just quit a career that I was successful at. And now I was stuck in a position to where I was felt doomed to fail. So it, that was one of the bigger challenges early on and just getting through the whole process. School is daunting. There's a lot to go through and, you know, it can, within that time, you can feel like quitting and I encourage you not to. I have just decided that I was going to do everything that I could do while I was there. So I went and joined Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society and did events with them, so helped, helped organize them. I joined Mesa, the Math Engineering Student Association, and became a tutor, which I think was one of the biggest things that helped me to be successful on the dental admissions test, because when you're teaching people the stuff you're learning, you're learning it more, but it also felt good to help those that were in the same path as me to continue on their journey and to be successful. Um, I became I'm another tutor for uh, chemistry in general. Um, I helped form an engineering club because I was looking at engineering as an undergrad major at the time. And then I joined the American Dental or American Medical Student Association um, at America River College, became president, and kind of carried that through to a pre-health conference, um, very similar to this with founding some of the same founding uh, people in it um, over at UC Davis. And it, it did just stayed involved in everything all the way through. You don't have to do that. People have much more things going on in their lives than I did. I didn't have any children. I wasn't uh, dating or anything at the time, not married. And so it was a little easier for me to do all this than somebody who's got an entire family that's trying to keep it together there at home also. So well, if you see all this stuff that I did here, um, it's not about the quantity as much as it is the quality, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, I went to UC Davis for three years um, after American River College, and during that time, I received my degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. I was a project uh, lead researcher in a lab that I was in, and 
um, continued through Davis uh, working on the pre-health conference that was there. It was uh, at a point in time, I had some friends talking to me because I was going towards medicine at first. And I had some friends talk to me about, hey, have you, have you ever considered dentistry? And to me, it was like, well, no, not really. And of course, since everything is better than studying for the MCAT, I started looking into dentistry and then realized, okay, I'm studying for the MCAT at this point. I need to just stop and finish it. And I, I finished my MCAT. I scored well enough that I could have gotten to medical school. Uh, but ultimately, um, through shadowing and volunteering in different clinics um, and doing some uh, other volunteering events that were giving dentistry back to the public and underserved areas, I really felt that that was the way that I needed to go. And so I dropped the whole idea of uh, dental or medical school. I turned around in that year uh, after taking the MCAT and started studying for the DAT. And I got into University of the Pacific in San Francisco as a entering class um, in the new building uh, that they just created. So I got to uh, be in the, the first class there. There were other there were other classes that moved over from the other school, but um, I went through the, the whole program in the new building and it had a lot of great technology. So basically to summarize again, what I did is, is that I quit working in 2009 and decided on dentistry in 2013. Um, I took the DAT that summer. I got my primary, primary applications in. Um, it wasn't until September, unfortunately. Um, some of that had to do that with my switch last minute and had to, I don't, don't say scramble, but needed to really focus on um, getting the pieces and parts together that I was missing at the time. Um, I ended up uh, received uh, a bunch of rejections invites and a few acceptances and in that whole process um university of the pacific was one of the places that i had gone to during my exploration in dentistry and for me the all the people there the faculty the staff the students um very engaging and it was not that the other schools weren't but i had just decided when they gave me an acceptance that um, that was the school of my choice, and I was absolutely going to take it. So cost to apply, I kind of summarize this. There's a lot of costs in dentistry and healthcare that come along the way that you just aren't told about. And that does include, you know, what it's going to take you just to apply. And so for me, DAT and study material, this is low because some of the study programs that you can go and get into are going to cost you far more than $1,100, but that's what it cost me. Um, I applied to 15 schools, and at that time, that cost $1,500 to apply to 15 schools. And then when they sent me back the secondary applications, it was another $1,500 because you have to pay the application fees from each of the individual schools. My travel expenses for interviews, $1,400. It's probably not that bad for today's standards. I did go to the East Coast, or half, not East Coast, but went out uh, in that direction once. And then most of my other interviews were between here and Nevada. Um, all the deposits, I deposited for one school to hold a spot for me. And then when I got into UOP, I put money there. And I'd had a few different areas at the time that I was uh, had taken acceptances and paid to hold my seat. And that cost me $4,500. And just other things, uh, passport photos, I didn't need to fly out of country, but you need to have this information for um, your applications, uh, posters, dry cleaning, new clothes. $200, that's pretty low. Um, my clothes, uh, I know that's not a typo because I had most of my stuff before, but um, if you don't have any clothes, you're probably going to spend more than that for a professional set of clothes. And that came to a grand total of $10,235 for me to do the applications, go and interview, and then end up in dental school. So I just want to go kind of break away mostly now from, and I, wanted, I do want to talk about challenges and I kind of gave you some of those, 
But um, if, if there's anything specific at the end we can go into, because some a lot of my challenges were kind of figuring out what I need to do to get in there now. Um, and or at this point, I told you I got in there, but just before that, how to get in to the school, what to do. And I want to step through this. Um, you're going to, some of this information, some of the pictures are old, but I looked up the requirements and things online recently, and I've updated this uh, almost all the way through here. So first thing you're going to want to get is the official guide to dental schools. It's on Adia's website. Um, the 2013 picture on the left is the book that I bought, but the new one is 2023-24. It shows you every single school that you can apply for um, through ADSAS and others, and it gives them a page front and back um, in order to tell you what their average G GPA is, their DAT, what their tuition cost is, cost of living in the area. Um, acceptance numbers, if they have certain required courses. This was important to me because one of the schools that I wanted to apply to required a genetics lab, and I did not have time to take a genetics lab. And if I didn't know that information and I applied there, I wouldn't get my application money back. You, When you send them the application and you pay, the, that money is gone. So you're going to want to strategize on which schools you can apply to based on your background as far as you know your scores and what classes you've taken so this is to me this is one of the most important takeaways from this whole presentation is go ahead and get that book um, the dental admission test this is a very big factor for schools it's not going to be you know the ultimate factor at all, but this test is going to set you aside from others on your ability to basically, what have you learned before getting here? Um, what uh, What's your taste taking skills? What's your critical thinking skills? Um, and we'll go into a, a couple of the sections here in a second and I'll show you things that you need to know and study for. But, you know, I said it's best to take it a month before your application cycle opens, I would say it's best to pass it a month before the application cycle opens, because if you don't pass this, it's going to, it could potentially uh, put your application out a year or have you applying towards the end of the cycle and it's going to decrease your chances of getting in. So um, as of now, the DAT costs 525 and it's, um, it is advertised as a four and a half hour test. Um, I think when I took it, I, it took me five hours to finish it. Um, you want to you want to select all the schools when registering for the DAT. I put that at the bottom. That may be outdated. I don't have access to the application actually now, but when I applied, um, you, it said which schools do you want to apply to. It didn't cost anything um, or which ones do you want to have access to your information, not apply to. And it didn't cost me anything to do that, but then later, if you want to give them access, I think you have to pay. So be very careful and, and read and understand the application before just adding things, saving things, sending things, because um, you might not be able to go back. Um, and then this is what I was talking about. I took this straight from the American Dental Association um, website. And this is, if you go through this, I'm not going to read the whole thing and you get to the end. If you have, failed the DAT five times, you have to wait 12 months before you can take it again. So you get to that point, um, unless somehow you know for sure that this is what you want to do with the, for the rest of your life, you know, um, you know, there has to be something going on that's prevented you from passing this. Um, you know, you should consider um, your decision in dentistry kind of at that point, or really find out, you know, before you even get there, um, if, you're pa if you're failing the test, what is it that you're missing? And that, I'm not gonna judge anybody that has gone through this at all, but um, you're sacrificing a lot of your life just to pass this test at the time if you're not able to pass it. But, the, but that's something to know is, is that you wanna take it serious when you are studying for this test um, so that you don't get stuck in a hole. Um, so on the DAT, there's four major sections, pardon me for the movement of my minutes there, but um, 
is they give you a tutorial. Just most computer tests that you go and take are going to give you a tutorial on how to use the software. Then you go in and you're going to do your biology, general chemistry, and organic chemistry. You have 90 minutes to complete that. Um, the perceptual ability test, um, you got 90 questions on that, 60 minutes. Reading comprehension, you're going to read essays and you have to answer questions about what was in there. 50 questions in 60 minutes. And then quantitative reasoning. Um, it's math. It's it's math and kind of for me it was i'd never learned or took a class on the type of math that is in this section it'll ask different things like so many seat people are sitting in so many seats at this ball game and this person gets up and moves over here and it just it it's you really want to focus on this math section um i, I forget to back that example up and it, it uh in fact, I'm still confused about it, but I passed it. So I'm going to go ahead and move on from here. Um, in the perceptual ability test, this is the idea is to test your spatial awareness. When you're looking at x-rays and you're looking at teeth and, and different orientations um, and trying to judge the patient and their uh, problems they're having, looking in the mouth, I mean, you, you really don't get to see that much. And so your ability to do well on this it's supposed to translate into your ability to be able to perform dentistry because you know what's going on. And so you've got to take on the, on the keyhole is you've got to see one of those images over on the left. And you take that image, you look at the five on the right, and which one does it go into? And so this is something that it looks fun, but you've got to go fast on these tests when you get to them because you're going to um, you're going to run out of time if you don't have a system of approach to being able to get through this. Um, the top front end visualization sections, uh, you basically get an image on the left. It shows you it shows you one view, then it shows you another view, and it says if you turn it over to the side, which image is the one that is represented there. Angle ranking, you've got to be able to rank them from the most acute to the most obtuse or as they're opening or closing, depending on uh, the instructions. And they try to trick you by spinning them and making the, the arms or legs uh, ends uh, stick out longer in some areas than others. So another thing that you've got to get good at and fast at. And then hole punch is basically taking a piece of paper and you fold it and then you fold it again and you punch a hole in it and when you unfold it where the hole's going to be so if you have time you can practice doing this on actual paper um, but uh, you're going to have to be able to do this in your head on the test and finally cube counting they're going to give you pictures of different cubes you're not going to see everything that's going on exactly and then they're going to ask you questions about them and so um, this can throw you off uh, as well uh, just because it all kind of looks the same. And finally, uh, the pattern folding section, um, you're going to get something on the left and they're going to say, well, when we fold this up, which of these can it be? So a lot of these actually, I like puzzles like this. So a lot of these were fun. Um, I didn't ace it, but I did well. Um, but it did take a lot of work still, even though this is kind of a um, types of puzzles and things that I like. And then finally, I'll start up by saying you get your scores back. And this, these aren't my scores. Um, I ended up pulling them from somewhere at the, at the time I made this presentation. But you're going to get your scores back, and they're scaled from 1 to 30. Um, you want to you know, you aim for 20 plus in each section. You know, the higher, the better. Um, it's going to make this less less of a chance to be something that prevents you from getting into all the schools you apply for. Um, 19 is considered a national average and the way they average things is based on who takes the tests and, and this particular test. And so um, there is no, you have to pass this many questions to get this score. They don't have that posted or and I don't, don't believe that's the way they do it. So besides the those four sections, um, the science, the reading, the math, and the PAT, uh, they give you scores on just the total science, and then they give you the academic average, which is all of them, what the average is with all of them except for the perceptual aptitude test or perceptual ability test. 
um, that one you uh, need to, or, or they just want to see that score by itself. So what I studied with is on the screen. Some of these I looked online, they're still relevant, but you're going to want to make sure before just taking what I have here and using that as your primary resource. I mean, your primary study resource should be trying to master the classes that, um, that you're taking right now, because you have a lot of time if you're still in the beginning or the middle of your college education or pre-dentistry um, to learn the things without trying to find something that's gonna cram all this information in your head, because that's really the bad way to go about this test. But it is nice to have things that are focused around the DAT itself to help you to refresh your memory on things and fill in the gaps that maybe you didn't learn something um, during those courses you took. You know, they can't, it was a limited time. They can't teach you everything, and especially can't teach you everything that's going to be de like detailed just so you can pass the dental exam. Um, the primary application system is the ADSAS. Um, it allows you to apply to many schools with one application. Uh, it's very powerful. You can go in and look at all the updates. Um, you can um, do a lot of like pain. You do your, put your essays in here and everything. Um, there's some exception to put a question mark because um, I saw in there, Texas was something I don't think, I don't think you applied for those schools before, or you still have to take the TMD, ZAS, and the, it says on the site, if you're a resident and you're applying to Texas schools and a resident of Texas, then you might not be able to use the ad ZAS completely for that. And same thing, like you can apply to some Canadian schools, but I'm not sure which ones you can't apply to. Um, and you might need to take the Canadian DAT as well. So when you're applying to schools, again, like determine what their specific requirements are um, before just sending out your application to them or else that might cost you something that you can't get back. So the sections, um, you're gonna input information about yourself and background. If you have disadvantaged status, um, you're gonna put all your education and transcripts, um, your DAT scores. Um, you're going to put any professional experience that you've had, personal statements, um, your letters of recommendation, there's going to be release statements in there, and then des dental school designations, so where you want to go to dental school. Um, the, you want to, when, as soon as the application cycle opens, um, there's going to be some things you can fill out right away um, that I had mentioned, and one of those is putting in your college information. So, Definitely get that started. Do whatever you can. Ultimately, your goal should be to submit your application as soon as possible. And so what's hard sometimes is that you have to wait till you graduate and get your scores to have your full grades um, to put in here, or you're waiting on some letters or this and that, but it's gonna take you a long time to do the application in general. So just get it, like get as much done as you can. A lot of dental schools go and interview and accept people based on rolling admissions, which means that those interviews they do right away are gonna be very few because they're not a lot of people are done with the application process, but they also have to start accepting people because they're not gonna be able to accept an entire class that are gonna be successful and what they want if they just wait till the end. So few applications in the beginning, they're accepting people. It's easier for those students to shine and to get a spot in the class. Towards the end, if they've got hundreds to thousands of applicants and only a few seats left and you're in that pile because you applied towards the end of the cycle, um, your ability to get into that school is greatly lowered um, statistically than uh, it would have been if you would have been able to apply early. So just try to apply early is my piece of advice. I had to apply late and I, I was sweating it and I got my one acceptance during the regular acceptance period. Um, and then I didn't hear from anybody for months and it worked out in my favor, but um, don't, don't procrastinate. That could have threw me off big time. 
So professional experience is where you put any kind of honors, awards, scholarships, any dentistry shattering experiences, any extracurricular volunteering, community service that you've done, any research experience, um, any work experience. It includes military service. So here's where you kind of build your, your resume or your, your work history. Um, you get a chance to put in, uh, these numbers may be wrong. I'm, I'm going to show you the numbers that I had when I applied. Now is you get to put in five honors awards and scholarships. Um, it wouldn't allow me to put in any more than that. Um, it allowed me at the time to put in five dentistry or shadowing experiences, anything dentistry related. Um, I did have five. I'm only showing he one here because I just kind of have generic uh, other dentistry shadowing experiences. I grouped them as one. But um, so if you have more um, and there is a limitation, you're going to have to pick what you can choose. Um, any extracurricular volunteering community services, I just listed out in my time everything that I could put in here. And then it turns out that I had to go back and not enter a lot of these. I had to, um, I think it was limited to 10 and I had something like 15 and for me at the time, it was like, wow, you know, I mean, I'm glad I did those things, but it would have been nice to at least put those in the application. And research uh, experiences, you can put up to five. And work experience, it left me with five. So I am, uh, you know, I worked before I went to school. I had different jobs. I had different experiences with those different jobs. Um, but only five of those are ones that I could put um, into my application. So I chose what made the most sense and I put those in there. So things to consider based on that is quality over quantity. You want, it's, it's nice if you need to explore, if you need to go out and do things, um, then do them. I mean, I needed to and I don't regret it. But you're not going to be able to communicate everything about everything that you did or even list it potentially if there's limits like that in there. And really, they, when they're applying and they're looking at your, everybody's application, I mean, how much time do they have to go and to look at everything, right? So you want to you want to make sure that what you say is important and impactful to you. I mean, obviously, you want it to them, but this is this is you, your experiences. Um, in life and um, the more you work on one thing, the more understanding, the better you can be at it than you can at a bunch of different things that you've spent a day doing only. So like, uh, find out what's important to you and I would uh, highly encourage you to pursue more of that. So a personal statement, you're gonna have to put a personal statement in uh, the um, so you have to put a personal statement in your application. It's going to uh, limit you or ask you to uh, be 5,200 characters or less. And from what I read on the recent website is, is that when you hit the button to send that, you can't change it later. So if you're if you're in there and you're editing it within the application and you accidentally go and send it or, or something, um, I'm not even sure if you can go just save it without sending it and locking it in. Um, you might mess up your application just by doing that. So I highly encourage you to go and to use Microsoft Word or whatever your favorite word processing program is outside of the application when you're writing your personal statement. Um, admit, admission committees, they're looking for individuals um, with a lot of different, uh, a lot of different characteristics, you know, the thing, some of the things that uh, they may be looking for motivated individuals um, that they want to make sure that you're academically prepared, because if it doesn't look like you're doing well in your college classes, well, so when I was in dental school, it was like 25 plus science courses with labs in a, in a quarter. You know, it's like, I had never experienced anything like that by going to college. So um, if I didn't do 
uh, as well as I did in college, then I might not have made it through dental school. So they're looking, they're definitely going to look at your grades and they're going to make sure that, you know, they want to get people in there that can articulate um, what they're trying to say well, and they're socially conscious, and that you're knowledgeable of, about the profession. If you don't have any shadow experience at all, any volunteering experience, or anything really around dentistry, um, there's no way that you're going to convince anybody that you really want to do the job. Like, you have to know what it's about, like, firsthand, and not just reading about it. Um, personal statement advice. Um, they want to answer the questions that are being asked. It's very easy, and I've seen a lot of personal statements. I don't help people edit them anymore, but I used to help people edit their personal statements. And it's it's very common that it will ask the the prompt will ask a question, and then I'll read whoever's statement and go through it. And and I'm like, you talked a lot about your history and background and what where you are and why you want to be a dentist, but you didn't answer the question, right? So. You want to be sure that if you're if you're doing if you're in here and answer and, and you're going through your essays and stuff like that, they want to have an answer to the question. They don't necessarily, you know, and it's going to look bad if you don't do that. So, and then the next one, use correct grammar and spell checker. Um, absolutely, use concrete supporting examples um, that tell you how you grew and learned. So. Things like I worked for the summer um, volunteering and helping people in dentistry, and I seen many instances where you know people um, received treatment they could have re couldn't receive before, and I now want to go help and support in these areas because I know I can give back. You know, something that something that is concrete it means it's objective. It's something that took hold on you and not just a general generic thing you know you want to have you want to have these things in your life anyway and then understand yourself in the direction that you uh, choose to pursue your passions um don't list what is in other areas of the application they're already going to see it once even if you get a question back that says or sounds like the same question that you had before let's say in a secondary essay that you've got to um, complete write something new um being lazy you know or being thought of as being lazy in this when they're the gatekeepers that are going to allow you to potentially help or harm somebody um, from performing health care on them if they look and they think that you're going to be lazy about something there's a there's a good chance that with the number of applications they receive they're just going to put yours to the side so put in your time um and you know, and it doesn't stop after that. And your work, once you get out of, and out of school, you got to keep the momentum going. Um, but you want to you want to make make this all meaningful. You know, keep keep your writing simple, though. You want to organize it logically. You want to go in a flow that makes sense. So it's it's like a movie. You know, from start to finish. You don't necessarily like people don't want to get lost and not understand um, what they're reading and why they're reading it and get a couple of good proofreaders but you don't want to have too many the more that I passed my personal statements around to other people the more that I'd have somebody say this is good and somebody say this is bad they'd do this and somebody would look at somebody else's proof and say I wouldn't do that um, you can go on forever like that. At the end of the day, you've got to get it done, but you want good proofreaders. You want somebody that is, um, uh, can look at your uh, paper and give you uh, good advice. So you want to also, you know, be yourself, but don't be too casual. You're still, it's still a professional application. Um, you're having it looked at by professionals and in that also i just want to say just revise 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 it's very important that you start any of these early and you can sleep on it and you can go back and look and go oh i would say this read your personal statements out loud does it sound good to read it out loud um just, just constantly kind of tweak it until you get to a certain point where 
it follows some of these principles. And, um, but if you just do a first draft of everything and send it, um, at least for myself, uh, like it wouldn't have helped me at all in any way. So letters of evaluation, um, you get to determine what the schools need ahead of time. So look at the, the IDEA guide to dental schools that I was talking about, or if you have another resource, um, definitely go and use that. But some of them require like one dentist or two dentists or one faculty member or a researcher or a spiritual advisor or, or certain things like that. And when I submitted my letter as a recommendation, there were limits on how many I could submit. So I, I don't remember, or I remember thinking, how am I gonna apply to all the schools that I wanna apply to when I can't, add everything that I need to add in here, you know, and you can only, um, you can only send a certain amount, I think it is to certain schools. So you want to kind of get an idea ahead of time. There's a lot of stuff you can do now if you've got a ways to go. Um, so uh, start looking now. You, you're going to want to develop a relationship with potential writers, and you're going to want to ask for a good letter of recommendation. If somebody says uh, they can't give you a a good letter, then just move on. Don't take it personally. Um, it, you don't know the, their situation that might not be an attack at you at all, but you've got to, um, you have to have them. They need all the schools is a requirement, but they're, they're going to want to look at these and see, you know, what impact you've had uh, in the point of view of others. And then interfolio, it was something that I'd used at the time. I see it's still available. I don't I haven't used it since I applied, but it did allow you and still advertises to allow you to collect a lot of letter writer information uh, or their letters ahead of time before the application cycle opens. So if you're looking at that slide where I had rolling admissions on there that I was talking about and worrying about how you're going to get all this stuff done fast after the application opens. Um, this is a tool that may help you to get your application uh, submitted earlier. But take a look at it. Um, use your judgment on it if it works for you. So what happens after you apply? You're going to get supplemental applications. So all the schools are going to send you back requests for different things. And uh, one of the most common is, is they're going to ask you for, for you to write additional essays. Um, you're going to interview. I recommend you send some thank you letters after you interview and um, accept any offers you got. And there's the withdrawal letters is down there because that's a requirement. So you'll need to look at that too. So the secondary applications, um, the requirements are specific to the schools. And um, I kind of said most of these things here, you know, just follow the same rules as personal statements if you have more essays to write and don't copy and paste from the original into this one because they're going to already have that and they're asking for specific other information. And even if, like I said, even if it sounds like what they're asking for is the same, um, same, same question, same answer as what you'd given before, write a different essay. Use this as an opportunity to provide more information um, about what makes you tick. So I can't go on talking about interviews without talking about what to wear. So I can't tell you that your choice in clothing is good or bad, you know, and, and they're just going to make you fail or pass, you know, the, the, interviewing process, but in general, like they're going to want you to be in business professional attire. And so these are sort of traditional things to think about and to look at, um, you know, have your, have your clothes dry cleaned and pressed. Don't, you don't want to stand out too much. Um, you know, like for guys or girls, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, um, whatever, like you, anybody can wear and be successful in the, a suit, jacket, tie, black, navy blue. Um, if you're gonna wear a skirt and you wanna have it long to your knees, not hiked up, you don't want to have saggy pants, shirts being too short and showing too much skin, um, definitely not advised. Um, you know, shoes 
and your belt should match colors. You know, have your get your hair cut, have your nails groomed. Uh, try to avoid closed-toed shoes and big heels. Um, if you made it to the interview, you want to just kind of coast through it, get the information that you can. Um, you still want to impress the admissions people, but you wouldn't be at that interview if you hadn't impressed them already. I would advise you to not try to stand out with anything way too flashy and non-traditional. But like I said, um, to each their own, uh, you're welcome to wear whatever you want. So interview preparation, uh, review your application, you know, read up on the schools, make a list of questions based on the schools. You don't want to go out there and they say, well, why'd you come to our school? And then you answer the question then with something that can, is like on the front page of their website. Um, you also don't want to ask them a question that has the answer on the front page of the website because then they'll know that you haven't really even looked into their school. So practice answering and read questions with people, write them down, think of what people can ask you. Just do you, you've got to build for this. It's, a, it's practice and you want to prepare for a writing sample. I got to one of the schools and they said they when we started, they had to sit down and they had to write something. And then when we left, we had to write something. So um, I think that if you get through the process, though, and you do all these essays and you've been rewriting them and stuff, you're probably going to be OK for doing an impromptu uh, writing sample. But be prepared for that. And like, don't quit if this is what you want to do. This all sounds like a lot. I'm throwing it out here so that you don't wait till the last minute and get started on these things. Um, so when you're at your interview, you know, shake people's hands, make eye contact. Don't cut off the interviewer, allow them to speak. Um, if you're not sure what they said, just ask, you know, with, uh, for clarification. And if when they're asking you questions, you want to answer the question concisely and try not to drag it on or maybe say a bunch of things but not quite answer the question. Um, it really throws off the interview. And, you know, try to smile. You're there. You're happy. You know, we made it to a dental school interview. It's not easy. Um, thank you letters is completely optional, but when you when you're done, it's nice to send a thank you letter. Not a lot of people receive them. I mean, I get thank you letters from my patients sometimes, and it feels good. You know, they're not looking for a job or to get into dental school. I mean, it's not the point, but it is it is nice, and maybe that's that one thing that'll help you stand out. Also, um, accepting offers. Um, First offers are given out and you have to typically pay a deposit to accept it um, within 15 to 30 days. And those aren't refundable, just like I showed you what I paid uh, several slides ago. Um, some schools have one, two, or even three deposits as you go. And I know I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna scoot along a little bit. Withdraw letters, um, you're gonna, um, once you're accepted and a period of time uh, goes by, you're going to need to withdraw from schools that um, you're not accepted or you're not going to accept or else all the schools can drop you. Um, and so the main, main takeaways, though, is just get as much dental experience as you can, leadership experience, community experience, and, um, you know, save up some money because there's going to be unexpected things that you're going to need to pay for. Um, let me get over here to the end. Make sure you get your sleep and uh, that's kind of it. I got a few slides just, just sort of summarizing um, what I'd said just a second ago. And you know, ultimately don't give up uh, on your dream. You gotta do the challenges. Even if you don't get in the dental school or you change your mind, life is gonna be challenging. It, it, it's it's hard, it's all basically how you perceive things. Um, if you just go and do the things you need to do, um, you have a good chance of becoming successful at whatever it is that you do. So most important thing though with all of this is just to remember, it's all about the patient, that's why we're here. Um, and at the end of the day, when you're out working, it, it, it's all about the patient, so. Uh, thank you guys for allowing me to talk for an hour. And um, if anybody has any 
questions uh, that I can answer, I'd be happy to do so. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stout, for the very inspiring presentation. I know Dr. Stout, since he was a first year in dental school, and um, it's always so great to listen to his speech. Um, so, okay, I do have a few questions from the audience. Um, so, first of all, how old were you when you started, um, like, your dental school? Um, when I started dental school... I was, I want to say 39, um, 30, 38 or 39. Great. So that would be considered as the non-traditional path. Correct. There were students that were in my class that went, went a certain path that they were 22 and licensed. They finished everything by that time. So definitely not, not traditional to add another 16 years on top of that, you know, kind of well, kind of weave throughout life into different things that um, have been beneficial, definitely, and have helped me to talk to patients and, and do uh, my job successfully. And um, me personally, at 22, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but um, I do envy that, that I could have been doing it a lot earlier and a lot further along, but um, yeah, and I hope that that helps. So following up on that topic, um, do you think age was any issue for you when you started dental school? Um, I think the only, for me at that time, I mean, I was, I was taking really good care of myself um, I generally do. And so my mind was still pretty sharp at that point, but I will tell you that, um, pulling all nighters in dental school or medical school or whatever you're at, or just college to get your tests done on time. Cause it's hard and you're going to have to, I think I would have handled it better if I was younger, but you know, and, you know, being in my late thirties and doing all nighters to study for tests, I mean, it, it really wears you down. Yeah. Um, so I, I have another question from the audience. Um, so what did you think was most important in selecting which dental school to attend? After attending dental school, what did you find was most important in selecting the dental school you selected? So in order to select the dental school, I think the most important thing in the decision to select the dental schools was for me to go visit the dental school you will know when you walk through the door how people greet you or smile at you and if the students look happy or they look miserable or this and that. I mean, and then when you talk to them and I, I went to events, so a lot of the schools will have events where you can be a dental student for a day or things like that. And you go in and you get hands-on experience and observing how things are going. You have to know that any anytime you step foot in there, it's part of your interview. I mean, they're not gonna forget you, but it's the other way around. You're interviewing them when you go. But if I wouldn't have gone to um, the school UOP, for example, um, I, I don't know that I would have even applied to it. Um, they, they, they were the only three-year program in the country at the time. There's like, there's different benefits and stuff to it, but you don't know enough by just reading the book I, I mentioned a few times about how the culture is exactly at the school. And so having chosen that school, one of the things is, is that um, I think that you think your second question was, how has it helped me to have gone to that school? Was that the, it was a two-parter, right? So it helped me because they, there's a number of things at UOP that uh, were important to me. One is that they believe in uh, the humanistic approach to dentistry. And that is that, you know, we're here to treat each other and it's, it's about everybody and everybody helping each other. Um, they also, um, in the fact that it is really based on clinical excellence as well. Um, I felt at times like I was, like as if I was going to learn how to play golf, they made me compete against Tiger Woods at every one of my lessons, right? It was just, you had to do things and be perfect or you have to do it again and again and again. They don't, they don't, uh, they want you to be 
a safe beginner and they want you to come out being able to do the best dentistry that you can. And so that has just carried on with me. You know, you've got to think critically and, um, and don't be lazy. You know, people are paying, paying for you to be a professional and to do good service. So you better go figure out how to do the best dentistry that's out there. Great. Um, so another question, um, after all the depth that you have taken on, um, how, how are you managing that right now as a practicing dentist? Well, you do have options that are out there. Um, and one that I have, uh, taken on is that, um, uh, I took out government loans. So the government loans, they give you, uh, um, you can pay based on what you're making that year. So you don't have to pay um, it off in 10 years. Normally that's the thing you paid off like 10, 15 years or something. Um, so it's a, like a pay as you go or pay uh, payment driven program type of thing. And so um, it's gonna take me a longer time to pay that off if I choose to keep doing that. But it, um, it's, it allows me to go ahead and not really worry about my loans as much. And then you generally, when you work in anything, you're going to end up, um, you're going to end up making more money later as you become more of a professional and like, you know, but I wasn't trained to do implants. I'm doing implants now, you know, left and right. And you just, you're going to be able to manage your debt, but the best thing to do preferably is that like, don't, don't go into debt if you can help it, you know, if you can, if you can get through it without going into debt, that's the main thing. But otherwise, um, it's just, it's something that sits on your shoulders, you know, it's there, but it's, I'm not starving. You're not starving and you're also able to buy a practice, right? Yes. Um, I was also uh, able to buy a new practice. And so, um, and the banks, they're going to look at you. I can buy a house right now too, if I want to. And, and that's just because that debt, they look at it. And if you're, if you're a dentist or a doctor, your chances of maintaining that career and being successful are higher than anywhere else. You went through all the school and you've done all this. Um, companies are happy to give you loans that they wouldn't give to somebody else with half the debt that you have. So it's not really something that is holding me back. Yeah, they say your your doctor uh, MD or DDS is 150 points on the credit score. So, awesome. Oh, I didn't know that. That's good to know. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doctor Scott, for joining us today. I just have one question before we go to the next one. Um, if you have one advice to give yourself when you first started all of this, what would it be? So when I first started all of this, the one piece of advice that I would have given to myself is to think about why I'm doing this. And if it's all about money, there are easier ways to make the same amount of money I make or more than going through all of this. But, and you're not putting patients health at risk by making mistakes. You know, is this, is this what you want to do? Do you want to pursue this? Why do you want to do it? And don't do it for the money. That and if I had somebody tell me that in the beginning, maybe I'd have done the same thing. Maybe I would have done something different. But once you get started on this, um, if it's easy to get sucked into finishing, and it takes years to finish, and you put so much behind it, and you know you want to be happy and healthy with your career and decisions, and um, this isn't something that you can easily just go. Well, that was fun. I'm going to do something else. You know, so. Just know that again, um, it's all about the patient. Is this what is this what you want to do? If it's all about a paycheck, then um, I would look into other avenues as well. All right, thank you. All right, so thank you, Doctor Stout, for joining us. Thank you. Good uh, seeing you, man. For having me and allowing me to talk for an hour, and um, have, you guys have enjoyed the rest of the the event today, and have a great weekend.